An epidemic of bestiality, letters from an old issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly, your questions, and a live reading of the tag SIS on Tumblr, as voted on by my followers. All of that and maybe more on this episode of Common Filth Radio. This Thursday, February 19th, Tumblrista's Raw Volume 1 will be releasing to Bandcamp. There are six new episodes, brand new episodes, that are exclusive to this collection and will not be available anywhere else. Again, that's out on February 19th on commonfiltheradio.bandcamp.com, and I'm going to reveal the track listing for it right now. Texting and terrorizing straight boys. Fuck you, misogynist dad. Drenched my walls with chocolate sauce. The embarrassment of my art exhibition. Impure thoughts in the produce department. And trans bathrooms are bathrooms. Now, you will be downloading this um, as an MP3 uh, collection or FLAC, whatever other audio formats they offer are available to you. But with every download, um, each track will include a corresponding video file. So I'm excited for it. I hope you're excited for it. And it was a lot of fun to make. I have an issue here of Electronic Gaming Monthly from October 1997, which means that it's from... September 1997, since magazines are a month ahead. The reason I bring up this old magazine is because there are some really interesting letters in here that could have been written today and had just as much relevance. This letter from an anonymous uh, sender says, I've read about 9,000 letters addressing the subject of females being portrayed in a sexist manner in video games. These letters are stating how video game females are always perfect little Barbies with 100 pound bodies and long legs, and how it's so insulting that the female gender is being represented like this, as if being attractive is somehow insulting. Well, anyway, well, here's a new thought for your little craniums. The guys are portrayed in basically the same way. Akira, Ryu, Liu Kang, Guile, Shao Kahn, Wolf, and Saget are all muscle-bound string beans. People complain about how Shiva is almost naked. Look at Kentaro. All he's wearing is a tiny loincloth. The bottom line is, political correctness has gone way too far. Just lighten up. If in the minds of at least one person, political correctness had gone too far in 1997, what the fuck is it now? It's like anti-racism, anti-homophobia, that's the mark of the beast. If you don't have this mark on your forehead, you can't engage in the mainstream economy. If the Gamergate people aren't giving Gawker a black eye, they're telling you that these are good things. That if you have a negative opinion about any group of people, you should be removed from the society at large. Isn't it a sign of a guilty conscience that people, when faced with somebody who has a negative opinion, they say, oh my god, you're so horrible, as if the opinion had will lead to somebody killing that group of people to which the opinion applies. All racism means now is that you acknowledge the very clear differences between different groups of people. All homophobia means is that you think that basing your life around orgasm is a stupid idea. But you cannot discuss these things with people who are left of center with any degree of honesty. And sexism as it applies here, all sexism means is that you enjoy looking at attractive portrayals of the opposite sex. Certain people like to complain, well, having an attractive woman in a game teaches people that women are only worth their bodies. Well, you know what? Men are only worth their bodies. Really. Ultimately, what matters? What does nature care about? Nature only cares about reproduction. Everything else we do that is not related to reproduction, is just a denial of the inevitable. The denial of inevitable biological realities, which is, you are going to die. We are going to die. All of us. I am going to die. You are going to die. Maybe not now, but eventually. And don't you think that it would be a hell of a lot wiser to leave something behind greater than Oh, I'm going to complain about cartoon characters having too big of a cup size. And no, I'm not suggesting that you go have children that you don't really want. Lord knows that's the last thing we need. But that was quite a tangent, and there is one more letter that I would like to read here. It's from a Girl Gamer, 1997 edition of a Girl Gamer. 
When I was reading Interface, I came across a letter that caught my interest. It was from C.D. Wasp and talked about the negative African-American stereotypes in Twisted Metal 2. I really didn't realize it at first, but I'm glad C.D. pointed it out. Although the portrayals of Mike Axel and Bruce weren't to everyone's taste, I have to congratulate the makers of TM2 for one thing, the positive portrayals of their female characters. Far too often in racing games and cartoons, girls are driving prissy pink cars and have names like Pink Powder Puff. To me, the real sexist games are those Barbie doll games like McKenzie and Company for the PC, or the Barbie and Crystal Pony games that were created for girls. Hopefully, we've seen the last of those monstrosities. I can find better games to play like Resident Evil, Twist Metal 2, or Tomb Raider than those about a bunch of squeaky clean preppy girls whose main goal is to get a guy to take them to the prom. I think a lot of girls would really enjoy video games if people would stop convincing them that the only things they should like are boys, clothes, and makeup. Do people not realize that girls convince themselves that boys, clothes, and makeup are things to pursue? Girls like being presentable. They like to have boys taking them out. They like male attention. And that's a good thing. It shows that they have not had profoundly negative experiences with the opposite sex. It also shows that they aren't permanent penis envy cases. That they do not reject their nurturing impulses. Because most girls, they don't like to play games where you mutilate zombies, where you crash cars and blow shit up. That's because they have sensitivities to care and harm. You know, things that are required to raise well-adjusted children. It's sexist to make things for little girls, according to this moron. I just don't understand these people who let the things they don't like consume them to some extent. If you don't like something, who gives a shit? Like what you like, and like it because you like it. Not because I'm supposed to like it or, you know, it's cool to like it. You know, I, I guess I don't understand it because everything has been always very visceral to me. That the politics are sort of reverse engineered from my visceral reactions to things because I think I'm supposed to. I think it makes me sound smarter, but it really doesn't. It just looks like a rationalization, which is why I don't define myself by any particular political ideology. But I guess in our current status-driving culture, our status-obsessed culture, simple preferences need to be expanded upon to mean something more than just what you like or dislike. But I suppose in the end, all these letters show is that people have been far up their own ass for a very long time, and there have been some people who realize that, as, uh, as shown by the previous letter, because I remember... Um, I think it was Kite Tales back in 2013 made a video in response to Anita Sarkeesian where she's like, oh, why are women always showing their big boobs in video games? And why are women objectified and held to this ridiculous standard of beauty where she pointed out, look at these guys, they're all muscle bound. And this, uh, this, it's almost as if she read this letter for, it's almost as if she used this letter as a script for that video. And now I'm reminded, why is being a damsel in distress somehow oppressive? Shouldn't it be considered a positive that if you get into a bad situation, there is somebody in your life that loves you so much that they will risk life and limb, that they have a sense of duty and honor to save your ass? Oh no, somebody has a sense of moral obligation that they're ready to fulfill. Being cared for is so horrible. You know what's better? Making menstrual art. Yeah, that's what's, uh, that's what's out there. That's the big ticket. That's, that's what's going to give me happiness, rather than being loved. Well, let's talk about something that Miss Sarkeesian will never talk about, which is bestiality. Because this completely destroys the narrative that women are somehow perfect angels, yet they're completely badass, and can do anything men can do, yet... They are oppressed by those men. I talked about this extensively last week, um, covering a couple of different stories, but it just keeps happening. Which leads me to believe that there is a sick epidemic going on that nobody is talking about. And it's not as if I'm going out of my way to find stories with this specific angle. I don't find things. They find me. This is from nydailynews.com. February 13, 2015. 
Louisiana stripper Angeline Lotus indicted for sexual assault of a minor also had sex with a dog on camera. Angeline Lotus, 26, was arrested in October for allegedly giving oral sex to a three-year-old boy and recording it. She was indicted Thursday and faced his life in prison if convicted. Her attorney said she's going to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Do you find it as odd as I do, the fact that the more a society fixates on mental health, the more that society descends into madness? This woman has such savage gina tingles that no man can tame them. But I'm sure that she will get her insanity plea, and if she doesn't, she will get off quite lightly. And like last week, I have more than one story, except this time these happened within days of one another. This comes from K4.com and the uh, YouTube channel Women Nowadays, who posted the video of the news story. Dell City, Oklahoma. A Dell City woman is in jail after being accused of sexually abusing children and animals. Angelique Mendel's arrest came about as a part of the FBI's Innocent Images National Initiative. The unit investigates both real-world and virtual child exploitation cases. An officer in Washington, D.C. had taken over a group of web identities belonging to a known child pornography distributor. He was led right to Mendel. According to court documents, an agent working undercover chatted online with Mendel and she said she informed him she sexually abuses a 3-year-old and a 10-year-old. She even sent the undercover officer videos to prove her story. Court documents allege that Mendel had profiles on websites for people interested in bestiality. The description of one of the websites she frequented said it was designed to match individuals who share an interest in cross-species sexual activity with non-human animals. Neighbors we spoke with were shocked and horrified by the allegations. Mendel is charged with bestiality, child pornography, indecent or lewd acts with a child under 16, and authorized use of a computer. This is why I don't believe that all sin is created equal, because despair is a sin. But is that not a perfectly reasonable response when faced with stories like this? Depending on who you talk to, if you occasionally have feelings of despair, that's a sin equal in the eyes of God. That's an equal sin to fucking an animal. I am not stupid enough to believe that. What conclusions can we draw from this, though, if there are any to be drawn? We could say that 100 plus years of unchecked liberalism has left people with a completely atrophied sense of moral boundaries. We could say that there is a complete deficiency of true masculinity, and in response, women are severely misbehaving. Or you can combine the two and say that social liberalism, economic liberalism, has discouraged masculine behavior. It panders to the feminine because women naturally want to be accepted and be a part of a group rather than forming their own groups. And marketing, advertising, takes advantage of that. I'm of the opinion that it is a combination of these factors. You can't have people doing whatever the fuck they want. It just doesn't work. Now cue up the goons that'll find this and say, well, technically no one's being hurt in bestiality cases, so why is it illegal? I get the same people saying that gay incest can be approached in the same way on Tumblr, as you will find out in Tumblr East is Raw. Do you really want to live in a society where bestiality and gay incest laws are off the books? Because I sure as fuck don't. But whatever, my freedoms, my victimless crimes... Let's get into questions. I have a lot this week, and a lot of them are good, so I might save some for next week. We'll see what happens. We'll start off with the Ask FM questions. You can send me uh, Ask FM questions on ask.fm slash commonfilth. Well, this is funny. I haven't checked this since uh, about two days ago, and the most recent question I, <coughs> excuse me, I have is of the story about the uh, Louisiana stripper, so what an odd coincidence. But the question below that, the submission below that says, what's your opinion on anarchists? I've never met one that I've liked. And I think that it's odd that a lot of them are effectively leftists. I mean, a lot of them are like, oh, wealth distribution and do what you want and fuck the state, even though the state is what institutionalizes and incentivizes leftist behavior. Because with anarchy, 
you would think that nature would rule, the survival of the fittest, that rule would apply. There are no sex education teachers in the wild. There are no teachers in the, in the wild teaching their young how to insert a dildo correctly. Do these dumbasses not realize that government employment is wealth distribution? Beyond my personal dislike for them, when you apply their worldview to what the end result of what a stateless society would be, it makes absolutely no sense. There is no such thing as equality in nature. Equality is an idea made possible by the protections that civilization provides. And I'm aware that you have different branches of anarchism, like anarcho-capitalism and anarcho-primitivism, I think that's what it's called, and um, a, a big influence of mine could be considered anarcho-primitivist in uh, Ted Kaczynski, his manifesto um, has some pretty heavy anarcho-primitivist things, but that was more of an influence on me because of the perfect psychological profile he constructed of leftism. Next question. How are men going their own way any different from any other deviancy? I understand the desire to want to break away from negative social norms placed on men, but at the same time they are breaking away from good aspects too. Mother, father, families, marriage, raising and teaching children, leadership, etc. I think MGTOWs along with MRAs make a lot of good points regarding the structure of family law and how it's completely stacked against men. Marriage already benefits the woman because she gets somebody who is not normally by his nature sexually exclusive and he is rendered sexually exclusive through this contract. So when you have child support and alimony coupled with a 50% divorce rate, that's an incredibly dangerous proposition for any man. So the MGTOW argument that being a man and doing traditional things that men of the past normally did, it's no longer a palatable option, where maybe once upon a time it was. There is nothing in that argument that I can disagree with. So I think that having a family with a mom and dad and getting married and raising children and all that, their rejection of that stems from that very basic premise, that society has removed all incentive to lead a traditional life because it stands to make a lot of money off of its failure. But the reason why I don't consider myself a part of that group or any other group is because of the people that seem to follow it in the wake of its success. From what I've come to understand, a lot of the original MGTOW guys are guys that lived it and were burned by the experience, guys that pursued normal relationships, got married, and then got fucked over in the courts. Those guys have a completely legitimate perspective, but a lot of the people I find who follow them are looking for this snowflake label to apply to themselves to rationalize the fact that they're incapable of normal human bonding. In other words, a lot of virgins, a lot of involuntarily celibate people. So with all that being said, is it deviant? Well, we've talked about dog fuckers on this show already the past few weeks, so... Uh, Comparatively, no, I don't think so, even though, you know, if you took a closer look at it, you could make the argument that it is. Next up, ICF, great show. Should pornography be banned? Does it do more damage to the human psyche than most believe? Porn, like a lot of other things, I think, is a, um, is a symptom rather than a disease. It only exists because there are people so fundamentally damaged that they pursue it as a career. With regard to fixing the societal conditions that make possible its creation, I don't think instituting laws against its production would do much good with respect to that. The same thing can be said about laws regarding topics we've brought up earlier in this episode, but I still think those laws should exist. I think that professional pornography studios should be shut down by force, but how likely is that to happen? I don't know. And do I want to see people going to jail over some cell phone video they made while they're horny. Not really. Next up. Hey CF, since you're a religious man, what do you think of games that involve hell, such as Binding of Isaac or Dante's Inferno? I've never played those games, but um, uh, if they exist, that's fine. If games about hell exist, I don't really care about that. It is a fascinating subject. But if they're games that are all like, oh, hell's a cool place, Satan's a cool guy, then I really don't want to have anything to do with it. I think we got enough of that 
teenage new metal edgy satanist stuff back in the late 90s next question my sister is a full-on art school sjw she and i disagree on a fundamental level and the only reason we talk at all is because i'm slightly more liberal than the rest of the family any tips for dealing with her i'd rather not abandon her she's family and i still believe family is important i understand that it's incredibly difficult to deal with siblings and other family members that believe some incredibly stupid shit. As hard as that may be, you are right in not abandoning her. Because when it comes down to it, friends come and go, but with family you're united by blood. You will always have that commonality whether you like each other or not. And through that blood, a loyalty is manufactured. And through that loyalty, you have a safety net in case something goes wrong in your life. You have somebody to turn to to help you back up. A lot of people say that it's a lot easier to be nice to somebody than it is to be unpleasant, nasty, mean to them. When dealing with people like your sister, when dealing with those who have that set of beliefs, the opposite is true. It takes everything inside of you to not unleash the rage upon them that you feel. It takes a lot more to express pleasantness towards these people. But it's not like this is some idiot friend that you've had and you can easily cut ties with them. But with your sister, she's your family. So there is a legitimate reason to keep cool with her. And this is a young lady you are dealing with who is probably not too different from the young ladies that surround her. If you just repeat to yourself, forgive her Lord, she knows not what she does, you will feel a lot better about it because she really doesn't know any better. If National Socialism, Nazism were the fashionable, incentivized thing to believe, she would believe that. She is simply taking to the shape which her surroundings demand. Do you believe in evolution? To some extent, yeah. But it is not my god. I don't know, I don't think too much about it. That is not my fascination like a lot of these atheists have. They think it's some sort of silver bullet against spirituality, against theism. There's a reason why they teach kids about Noah's Ark in Sunday school rather than the nitty-gritty of what the religion really is. Kids are not yet familiar with the cruel nature of humans, so a lot of the teachings won't make a whole lot of sense with their limited experience. Alright, next question. What are your thoughts on Jehovah's Witnesses? No real thoughts. Um, I'm familiar that they exist, but I couldn't tell you the first thing that they believe. Next one. You said something about God abandoning us. I just think he's there for the people who will stay for him no matter what happens to them and won't turn their back the second something doesn't go their way. I really love listening to your podcast. You have a high intellect and are good with words. That's something that I said when I was feeling pretty bad at the time, and it's not something that I consistently believe. It's just a, it's just the thought that I have when things aren't going well or things, to me, don't look very good. And yeah, a lot of the teenage atheism seems to be oriented around, I didn't get what I want, some girl doesn't like me, ah, I hate my teachers, therefore God doesn't exist because I'm undergoing some hardship. And as a lot of us know, a lot of people don't grow emotionally, psychologically, mentally past a certain age, so it carries on. But thank you for the kind words. Next question goes like this. ICF, do you believe in ghosts and monsters and supernatural things like aliens and stuff? Um, I'm fascinated by the subject of things in the physical world that aren't entirely known. Things that are a solid mystery. And I do like to read 4chan's Paranormal Board on occasion. And I like reading stories, people's ghost stories and things like that. My problem with ghosts and monsters and aliens and things of that sort is that most people carry around a phone with them. And that phone has a has a good video camera on it, you know, compared to, you know, what cameras were 50 years ago. With everybody documenting every little thing on their phone, why hasn't anybody encountered a Bigfoot yet? Why hasn't anybody, while they're recording their vlog, while taking a walk through the woods, oh shit, there's Bigfoot in the background, and it becomes a big story. I would look forward to that day because it's not like the proof of existence of these things would somehow compromise any belief I have. But people have to realize that why they find things that are supernatural, worldly things that are unknown, why they find these things interesting is because it will remain a mystery. 
the question is always more interesting than the answer. So I think that if we did find proof of Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot or aliens, a lot of what makes those subjects appealing would go away. Next up, I hate going into the city now. It has become commonplace that fat women are wearing clothes like they are skinny, denim shorts, tank tops, etc. And I feel physically sick whenever I see them because all their folds of fat are just hanging out. God forbid I find her unattractive or I'm fat shaming. I think that a disgust response is rarely ever wrong. Removing people's disgust response is a lot of what leftism seems to be oriented around nowadays. But why do we get disgusted when we see these morbidly obese women and they're flaunting it as if nothing is wrong? We get disgusted because women's role in nature is to be a vessel of life. When you are morbidly obese, you are anti-life in more ways than one. If you are morbidly obese, you are going to live a shorter life. If you are morbidly obese, you probably cannot have children. You probably are not releasing your eggs correctly. Sorry to break this to you people, but health is not a social construct. Going back to an earlier point, this is why I laugh when people say, women, you think that women are just worth what their bodies can offer. This line of reasoning implies that all we want to do is fuck women. We don't want to fuck every woman on the planet. We want the human species to continue. And we want the human species to be functional. This is why men go off to war to die in those wars. So that women don't have to. Going off to war is not a direct mating strategy. It is sacrifice for the continuation of the people. So what does this have to do with fat people and why we're disgusted by them? It has everything to do with them. When you see a girl when you're out and about or whatever and she looks nice, she has a well-maintained body, she has some life in her eyes and she has a positive attitude, you're refreshed by it because you know that she's fit to continue the species. But what you're seeing in the city is the complete opposite of that. You have doubts when you encounter that kind of ugliness. You begin to doubt whether the species is worth continuing. You doubt that life is worth something. Avoiding this kind of hopelessness, that is why a disgust response is a good thing. Next up, what are your thoughts on Republicans and Libertarians? I think at this point in my development, I disagree with Libertarians on pretty much everything. I'm of the opinion that social liberalism has had a horrible effect on culture. And I think that capitalism, along with the state, incentivizes socially liberal behavior. We are all willing to sell our souls for a buck and it's just despicable. As for Republicans, it's bad enough that they are completely inept at politics. Worse is the fact that you can't trust them in any respect, because they all seem to be closeted homosexuals. They argue for the interests of businesses that promote liberal social policies. They're also completely ineffective or completely ignoring the fact that universities are churning out liberals by the millions. Ann Coulter wrote a really good piece about how the Republicans could go on offense with regard to the university system. They could bring these professors and administrators in front of Congress and interrogate them about how they're making these lavish salaries when they get to take year-long vacations and how they can have like three-day work weeks and still have this salary be justified somehow. So basically, fuck everyone, and everyone sucks, and everyone is worse than useless. I'm surprised, but this is the last of the Ask FM questions, and then maybe we'll get into the email questions. But it goes like this. Not sure if this has been answered or not, but I'll ask anyways. What is the future of our education system, or specifically my state of California's? Will the indoctrination only grow worse, or will there ever be a turning point? Will we ever see the apprenticeship system of old again? To get the apprenticeship thing out of the way, I think that's pretty much dead because apprenticeship cuts around the middleman that is the education system. Did you know that we as a country spend $1 trillion on education per year? $1 trillion of education a year. And what do we get out of it? A bunch of fucking morons who want to teach. They go to school to teach despite having no useful fucking life experience. Remove the veneer of civilization and what will you find? You will find a nation of homeless spinsters. At least they would be if they didn't have a one trillion dollar safety net that they've turned into a hammock by virtue of how fucking big it is. 
But whatever, children are our future. They're worth every penny. And you know what our future looks like? It looks like a bunch of kids that know the myth of Harvey Milk but don't know how to fix a car. I don't see a future in education that's any good. It's going to look a lot like how it does now, but with twice the money. Two trillion dollars. Two trillion dollars. Two times the students. Two times better students. Hey, we're functionally illiterate, but look, we got iPads in the classroom. Isn't that great? Me tap on glass. Glass make pictures. Move. Me like to tap on glass and watch cartoon on glass. This glass cartoon teaches about two mommy and two daddy. Before I get into the emails, I would like to read this question I got uh, from Twitter, and this came from Fat Red Anus. You've mentioned you are a Christian. How would you define church and state? What place would you say religion has in government? The church and state argument annoys me because... The atheist side seems to be fixated upon having religious symbols taken down that were previously in public places, not realizing that, you know, having a cross up near a school or the Ten Commandments in front of a courthouse is not establishing a religion. But that's just a personal annoyance that I have that doesn't mean too much. On a broader level, I'm not opposed to church and state having some involvement with one another because you look at Europe back when their monarchies were pretty unapologetically religious. And I would say that those nations were a hell of a lot better off then than they are now. These places actually had an identity and were strong and were not multicultural hellholes. And another thing that I have to mention that bothers me now that I'm thinking about it is how people complain that there's in God we trust on the money. It doesn't say in Christ we trust. But I think I've already talked about that. But getting back to the original point, I'm not saying that secular civilizations can't be functional. The Chinese have been around for quite some time. The Japanese have been around for quite some time. But when it comes to white European civilization, religious monarchies, when whites live under those, they seem to be a lot better off. And I will leave it at that. So we're finally to the email questions. And after that... We'll do a live reading of the sys tag on Tumblr. I will answer Han's question and Shane's question, then get to mine and Stacy's questions next week. So this is from Han. Hope everything is going well for you. Really enjoyed your live reading of a Tumblr tag. Might want to check out the Tweaker Nation tag for a couple of laughs. Oh Christ. But here is the question. Do you think women who are prostitutes have unplanned pregnancies or ones who have made numerous sexual partners deserve sympathy? Should they be treated as if they did nothing wrong? Can they redeem themselves in your eyes? Women who are prostitutes or have been prostitutes, no. Women who have unplanned pregnancies, yes. Women who've had numerous sexual partners, it depends. With prostitutes, they probably had some sad, horrible, heartbreaking things happen to them in their lives that led them to being a prostitute, but... I just don't see a way that they can be cleansed and rehabilitate themselves into a normal life. With women who have unplanned pregnancies, it's a yes for me. I know I said it, but it also depends. If she has an unplanned pregnancy with either uh, her husband or the man she intends to spend the rest of, her, rest of her life with, then you know what, that's fine as long as she doesn't abort it. I think abortion as a method of birth control is just disgusting. I mean, it's disgusting under any circumstances, but to have regular abortions, that's just so far beyond acceptability. With regard to women with multiple sexual partners, it depends on how many we're talking about. You know, if they've had like one or two, you know, high school, college boyfriends or whatever, you know, long-term relationships that didn't work out for whatever reason, it's dodgy to put a ring on one of those, but it's far more dodgy to put a ring on somebody who slept with dozens or hundreds of men. If you're dealing with somebody who's unrepentantly slutty, then they have no concept of loyalty. Therefore, they do not deserve to be married. If there is no sense of duty, if there is no sense of loyalty, then there cannot be a marriage. It will be guaranteed to fail. I'm reminded of this story that I read on Reddit some number of years ago about a guy he's married and he's complaining that he doesn't have his sexual needs met in the marriage. And and the lady's like, oh, I'm not really into that, whatever. And he later finds out that when she was in college, she did an orgy porn where she's getting all sorts of awful shit done to her on camera and she's loving every 
single bit of it. And the guy like the beta he is, he said, if she were upfront about this, I wouldn't have cared. I wouldn't have cared about her past. But she lied and said, oh, I don't like doing sexual stuff, really. And then he finds pornography of her. And that's what you're dealing with when it comes to women who have slept with an embarrassing number of guys. Alpha fucks, beta bucks. All right, let's get to Shane's question, and then we will get to the live reading. ACF Shane again, this time about girlfriends. My friend Christopher recently got a new girlfriend. They have been together for two months after knowing each other for a week or so. Recently, he has stopped answering our group of friends, and he doesn't participate in group activities we do. For instance, seeing a movie or hanging out at the mall like high school kids do. He has largely ceased contact with us in recent years, with me personally knowing him for about five years. Our inner circle has been discussing this, and I thought I would ask you, why would somebody put a girl they barely know over friends they have known for years? I have no problem with my friend trying to get some pussy. In fact, we all congratulated him when he told us about his new relationship. But we know that it negatively affects us. We don't want to lose our good friend over something small like this. Are we being upset for no reason, or are our concerns legitimate? This is why people reiterate bros before hoes, because pussy is some powerful shit. It'll make you do some weird shit, including uh, putting your homies on ice. He's completely entranced by this newfangled thing that he gets to try out all the time. And his girlfriend is probably like, oh, those guys are immature. You're a mature guy now. You have me. I'm all you need. It's hard to break the spell, but she'll break his heart eventually. High school relationships never last. When that inevitability eventually hits, be there for him. Don't hold his mistake against him because once that does happen, he probably will realize his mistake and beat himself up quite a bit over it. So don't pile on. Give him some patience, be good to each other, and everything should work out. All right, the moment you've all been waiting for, the live reading of the sys tag on Tumblr. And I'm going to do a, another poll again this week that you can vote on. I'm going to replace um, sys with another tag that you can vote on. So if you voted for one of the losers, it will eventually win. So I might do two in one episode one of these weeks. But check the links below for the poll and vote on it. And uh, whatever wins, I will read. So here we go. You literally shouldn't hate cis people for being cis, just like cis shouldn't hate you for identifying as non-binary, trans, etc. If you do, you're worse than your oppressors. What? You exist, therefore nobody should say anything bad about you. Simply being a lump is, uh, exempts you from criticism. Some boring Facebook screenshots... Awesome new and accurate word for cis people. Cis gusting. Yeah, you're very, uh, that's from trans, transgender. Oh yeah, you're, you're such a gem. You're <laughs> the pearl of social justice. Uh, something about algorithms. God, these people are nuts. Like, the term battle of the sex is blowing around the human consciousness for God knows how long is super cis-sexist and gender essentialist. And it totally embodies the ridiculous assumption born from unempathetic cis people that there are two sexes, not genders, man and woman, and that they inherently contain opposing characteristics. Never the twin shall meet. Never, what? And this is used to justify all the women are nags, men are sympathetic boors jokes in the world. Cis people are horrifying. Well, I don't think that they have opposing characteristics, but they definitely are characteristics that really only come into conflict when there is a conflict. When you're getting along with your wife or you're getting along with your husband, the differences never become weaponized. People don't realize that men and women, by and large, have a certain set of values women valuing care and harm like we mentioned earlier and men valuing loyalty and duty and so on this is what you get when you base your life on consumption this is from the same person this scene is the year 2100x tensions between tensions based rather on gender roles have built to a head in society cis men and cis women have divided more and more along the lines of distinction between the genders Gender war ideology took root in their fertile minds, driving them to their most immoral base urges. Oh my god. 
It all came to a head when cis men and cis women turned on each other in the battle of the sexes that raged across the world, claiming many cis lives while pretty much everyone else stayed home and had a nice warm cup to drink while watching TV. Fast forward to 2200. Due to the use of energy and biological weapons during the fateful battle, every cis person of the previous generation was eliminated. All that remained were those who did not hew to the pointless gender binary. Oh my god. Sci-fi has never been stupider. And it goes on. All that remained were those... Okay, I already read that, sorry. Uniting to rebuild their lives, it, it was as though the segregation and the stereotyping of children at their most vulnerable and impressionable had vanished overnight. Yeah, we teach kids to do what their bodies are supposed to do. And that's... That's preying on their vulnerabilities and impressionability. I think that's doing the opposite. I think that's making them so they aren't vulnerable and impressionable later down the line. But anyway, under the guidance of the trans who had witnessed the war, the new generation of non cis children grew up to create a world with newfound cooperation and unity, where binary gender and the roles that came with it were but the faint memories of a dark past, a shadow blown away by the light of the rising sun. It was a new dawn. The concept of cisgender had vanished, and nothing of value was lost. <laughs> I don't know if anything's going to top that, but we will read on. Anonymous asked, which means that they sent it to themselves, You are pansexual. You are a part of the queer community. So why are you standing up for those cis homophobic white boys? Also, if I were you, I would date someone who is not white, straight, and cis. You're a bad representation for Tumblr. So I'm going to date a trans person of color who's not straight. Well, the fact that they're trans means that they're not straight, right? So is that a bit redundant? Pansexual equals love regardless of gender. I love him more because of who he is and rather than the fact that he is white, cis, and straight. He's a good person. Calm down. Oh my god. And then she says some other boring shit. And then, get this. I'm only 14. I can't exactly memorize and know every single right and wrong. I make mistakes. I know I'm not perfect, but neither are you. Having privileges does not make you a bad person. Do you... <laughs> when do these people realize that they have the same worldview as people who are barely out of middle school? Don't call it a grave. Protect white girls at all costs. Protect cis girls at all costs. Protect straight girls at all... Okay, so this is just putting the screws to the uh, social justice crowd on Tumblr. Oh my god, a lot of these posts are really long. You really expect me to read your 20-page rationalization for why you are a horrible person? Here's a good one. I swear it is the hardest thing explaining gender to someone. You have a cis person who probably thinks you're an idiot who is talking nonsense, and they would be right. And then another cis person who tells you that sex and gender are the same. That if you look into the dictionary, dictionary they would be synonyms. The reason why it's hard to explain it to people is because it's completely non-intuitive. Oh, I feel like I'm a girl sometimes, even though I've never actually been one before. I'm only aware of the most base stereotypes of what a girl is, rather than knowing the psychological drive of what makes a, a girl a girl. This is why people have relationships with the opposite sex, to have a complete understanding of the human experience. You think that undergoing surgery and injecting hormones makes you understand human nature? You think that that's what brings you closer to it? If you're trans, that's fucking awesome. Good for you. Don't be an ass to the cis. If you're cis, that's fucking great. Don't be an ass to the trans. Oh my god. Why is everything great? Why does everything have to be great? This is what you get when you teach kids that people are not horrible creatures until proven otherwise. How do you feel about cis black males? That's a good question. I say they're not as bad as white cis males because they've never experienced white privilege and that kind of balances out with them being cis. Why don't you go visit the projects on Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard and see what they think about cis people. Go, go tell them about their cis privilege. 
Someone is trying to explain to me that cis people are murdered for being cis all the time. Then they point to people being murdered for being male or female as proof. Uh, what? Um, that never happened. I know that's a cliche thing to say now, but you can just tell. These arguments that people apparently present to them, implying that they talk to people at all, they read exactly the same as their arguments. Their own arguments. They have such little human contact that they assume that the conversations they have in their own head are how people actually converse with one another. It just never ends. This tag is full of endless madness. <laughs> one more. I'm very offended. You can't be an ally unless you prove yourself. I'm sorry I'm supposed to be initiated, flogged. Is this a sorority? No. Seriously, the whole cis are terrible people thing is a generalization. I really don't appreciate it. Maybe you should uh, stop associating with these people. Maybe these people are damaged on a fundamental level and you shouldn't be an ally. But I get it. You need to be a good goy for the good grades. All right, I can't take it anymore. I spent the last 10 days looking for this shit, writing episodes of Tumbleristas and... I need a little bit of a break, but Thursday is the big day. Uh, Tumblristas episode 7 is coming out on the same day as Tumblristas Raw Volume 1 is releasing to Bandcamp. And again, that's going to drop at midnight on February 19th, so keep your eyes peeled for that. It'll be up the same time I upload Tumblristas episode 7. So with all that being said, I'm a couple of seconds from being done here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I enjoyed doing it, so... See you guys soon. Take care.